Howdy there, BMETs, and welcome back. I have two requirements for you today that will aid in your success for this section. The first one is that you pay close attention to the schematic symbols, and the second that you remember the two conduction requirements that each component has. Today we learned about silicon controlled rectifiers, unijunction transistors, and programmable unijunction transistors. Now I know it was a lot of information, but the common theme today was that they all had two requirements to turn on, just like the ones I gave you to aid your success. With that being said, let's talk about our first component, the SCR. A silicon controlled rectifier is used as a current switch, meaning that it's controlled by current flow. It consists of three terminals, the anode, the cathode, and the gate. All the components we talk about, as I previously said, have two requirements to conduct, and the SCR is no different. The first requirement is that it needs to be forward biased anode to cathode meaning it needs more positive voltage on the anode with respect to the cathode. The second requirement, and this is the one that's actually turning it on, is the gate trigger. And the way I want you to refer to it as is having a sufficient amount of gate current because it's a current switch. Though we achieve this by placing a large enough voltage on the gate to draw enough current flow through that PN junction. Once an SCR conducts, it is latched in and will no longer require gate current. But how do we unlatch it? Well, we do this by causing the anode current, or IA, to fall below the minimum holding current, or IH. Essentially though, we just reverse bias. Then, to get it to conduct again, we'll have to meet both of the requirements again to turn it back on. Now that you understand the SCR, let's put it into a circuit. Take a look over at the circuit on the left. With positive 5 volts applied and positive 2 volts on the gate, we have an SCR that is meeting both its requirements needed to conduct. When an SCR is conducting, it will have a voltage drop of 0.7 to 1 volt, so a multimeter would read something like this if it were on. We've got two components in series, so the SCR is dropping 0.7 volts. That means the light is dropping the remaining 4.3. Now take a quick peek over at that switch on the left. With the switch open, we feel the applied voltage on the left side of the cap and 0.7 volts on the right side. So until we close the switch, the cap will stay charged and the SCR will stay on. Right now the SCR is latched, so let's look over to the circuit on the right. Notice that I removed the voltage from the gate. So how do we turn this off? See that closed switch? Closing the switch places zero volts on the left side of the capacitor and causes it to discharge to the applied voltage, which at the same time reverse biases the SCR and causes the anode current to fall below the holding current. And these are readings you would see on a multimeter when it's off. Lastly, look how it's forward bias anode to cathode but isn't conducting. Because we no longer have sufficient gate current, and it's going to stay off until we meet both requirements. Now let's use the SCR in a different circuit, the power control circuit. When used this way, the purpose is to rectify AC and control the amount of power to the load, which could be anything like a light or an alarm. There are two important components we discussed today. The first one was the firing angle. This is the portion of the waveform that causes the SCR to turn on, somewhere between 0 and 90 degrees. The other component was the conduction angle, which is the portion of the waveform that the SCR is conducting. They both add up to 180 degrees, so if we had a firing angle of 45 degrees, then the conduction angle would be 135 degrees. And you'll need to know this to calculate average DC voltage using the formula. Conduction angle divided by 360 times VRMS. And yes, we gave you the formula to calculate VRMS, and it's on your formula sheets, so pay attention to the units of incoming AC, and remember, no need to convert VRMS into VRMS. That is a common mistake, actually. The next component we learned about today is called the UJT, or Unijunction Transistor. How many PN junctions would you think this has? If you said one, you'd be correct. It is a single PN junction device and it is used as a voltage switch. And as you'll see in a bit, voltage is what's responsible for controlling this device. It's made up of three terminals, base two, base one, and an emitter. Just like before, there are still two requirements to turn on this device. The first being forward bias base two to base one, meaning base two has to be more positive than base one. The second is the most important. The emitter voltage needs to exceed the firing voltage or VP commonly referred to as the manufacturer's turn on voltage because as you'll see in the next circuit, it's what's actually turning on and off the UJT. 
So let's take the UJT and put it into an oscillator circuit. Take a look at R1 and C1 on the left. They're going to make up an RC time constant, so we know C1 is going to be charging and discharging, developing a sawtooth waveform on test point 1. Before we talk about that though, as soon as we apply DC voltage, Q1 is automatically forward biased base 2 to base 1. But the UJT is off because that's only one of the requirements. With it off, the outputs will look like this because there's no current flow. Now we can talk about the sawtooth on test point 1 and Q1's emitter. As it charges, eventually it will reach what we call the firing voltage or VP. As soon as it hits the VP, we are meeting both requirements, so Q1 will conduct. When Q1 turns on, C1 actually discharges through ground, through R3, Q1, and R2 developing a positive spike on test point 3 and a negative spike on test point 2. Eventually C1 discharges far enough below the VP that Q1 turns back off and the outputs return to their previous state. Then C1 starts charging back up to the VP again and the process repeats until the DC power is removed. Lastly, you'll need to be able to calculate the frequency using the formula below. You, can't, you can find it on table 6 of your formula sheets. Pro tip. The last component we're going to cover today is the programmable unijunction transistor, which is used as a current switch that can be programmed when to conduct. This component has three terminals, an anode, a cathode, and a gate. But this kind of thing looks like an SCR, right? Well, it's not. The key way to tell the difference is where the gate is connected. On this component, it's connected to the anode. Pro tip. Just like the other two components, this one has two requirements to conduct. The first is met as soon as DC is applied. It must be forward biased anode to cathode. The second, the anode voltage needs to exceed the gate voltage by approximately 0.7 volts. Knowing this, let's see this component in action. As soon as DC is applied, the putt will be forward biased anode to cathode, but that's only one requirement so it's currently not conducting. No current flowing through R2 means the V out is going to be low. R3's voltage drop develops the gate voltage, in this case, positive 6 volts. C1 is going to start charging at this point. Can you guess what it needs to charge to? If you said 6.7 volts, you are correct. We need to be 0.7 volts greater on the anode, and as soon as this happens, the putt turns on. Just like in the UJT circuit, it provides a path for C1 to discharge through ground. With current flowing through R2, it develops a positive spike on the output. And after a short time, C1 discharges well below the necessary voltage, and we lose that second requirement. When this happens, the putt turns back off, and no current flowing through R2, the output goes back low. And then C1 begins to charge again. And like that Journey song, the wheel in the sky keeps on turning. Lastly, the gate voltage and frequency are controlled by adjusting R3. If R3's resistance increases, the gate voltage will increase. This means C1 has to charge to a higher voltage, which takes longer before the putt turns on. This is why frequency decreases. If R3's resistance decreases, the gate voltage decreases, meaning that requirement for the anode is less, so it turns the putt on and off faster, so the frequency increases. Pro tip, R3 and frequency have an inverse relationship. All right, thank you guys so much for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe for updates on future videos. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments below. And be sure to remember those two requirements I gave you for success at the beginning of the video. And, as always, keep being awesome. BMET, out.